I can go relatively quickly. I'm Paul Warren with Public Policy Institute. Um, we're a nonprofit uh, group that works on uh, issues related um, to state policy. We do the gamut from water to higher education to criminal justice and um, health and human services. I work on education, and um, uh, a little more than a year ago, we came out with a report on um, special education, and I'm going to talk about a couple of issues that come out of that work. So I'm going to go full geek on you. I just have to warn you. Uh, I just have numbers. I don't have bullets. Um, so, um, so this gets to a point that Kristen raised, which is um, uh, you'll see this is a cohort of students who they were age three in 2014. So we see them when they're in the program at age three, and then we see how this cohort grows over the next years, next three years. And, and roughly, the population doubles over this period of time, okay? That is, as, as they get older, more kids are brought into the special education system and given services. So by the time they're in first grade, which is age six, we're, we're up to 40,000 students who are in special ed. So um, you can see the biggest category is this light blue, which is um, speech and language. And then the dark blue, which is a couple of levels above that, that's autism. Okay. So research has shown that uh, you can really benefit kids by getting them into early services. And Kristen talked about zero to three, and she's right. I don't talk about that uh, here. Uh, but, you know, the earlier, I think, is always the better because the brain research is showing that so much is going on in those early years. Uh, K-12 assumes responsibility for, for children with disabilities when they turn three, which is why I focused on this group. Um, the funding system, though, for uh, special education in K-12 doesn't recognize that districts serve this group of kids. Up, up, to the time that they get to kindergarten. Uh, you know, ADA, average daily attendance, is how funds are uh, calculated and distributed in California, and that doesn't include preschool services. So that means that districts that want to do a good job and really get these kids into their services as quickly as possible, they don't get compensated for that. They have to really take that out of their general fund uh, to pay for it. And that's a big disincentive. Um, so the report looked at two, two things that you could do. You could create a separate funding stream. You could count them as ADA, right? Um, but that's $10,000 a kid, which means you're talking about a half a billion dollars. That's a lot of money. Um, the other alternative is to give them better access to preschool. You know, for uh, Head Start, which focuses a lot on zero to three, they have a 10% requirement that kids be, you know, 10% of their kids be disabled. <coughs> Our state preschool doesn't have that, um, that requirement, and I think that's probably something that I'm going to be working on, uh, actually, I've been working on it, to try to understand what the barriers are in the state system uh, to, to having more kids be in state preschool. Uh, the budget does include $125 million, to, and part of that $125 million is about uh, creating more of a priority for disabled kids in state preschool, and we'll see how all that goes. So, so that's one thing. So here's the same picture, but for for kids starting at age three and going all the way through age 19. Okay, and this is the number of kids by disability category. <coughs> and this group started; they were age three in 2001. So it's actually a different group, and you can see the numbers are a little bit different. Um, again, you see in the early years, speech and language is, is really big, and then it kind of starts to collapse that group and get pretty small. By the time graduation rolls around, there really aren't many kids in that category. Whereas learning disabled, they pop up starting in uh, you know, the intermediate years of elementary school and uh, going to be the largest category so that there are more than half of the kids by the time the graduation was around. It's tempting to think that these are different kids, that the kids who start out as speech and language 
we address their problems and, and they disappear from special education, we just become a general aid kid. But we know that also some of those kids move to different categories. So when you have state level data, it's a little bit hard to understand clearly what's going on. But the point I want to get across here is that it's a very dynamic population. Kids are moving around. They're, some of those speech and language kids, their problems do go away. My daughter was in special ed for two years. She had a speech thing, you know, some therapy, uh, in a pull-out program, solved it, no problem. She was out, wasn't, uh, so, so there are those kinds of kids uh, who have their needs addressed and they graduate from special ed, so to speak. Um, why is this important? Well, d you know, data is kind of the bedrock of the reform process, right? We're saying we want to look at how kids are doing, find out what the barriers are for these kids, and try to make, help them be more successful in school, score better on tests, do better in class, have fewer behavioral problems. And this data makes understanding what's going on with kids very difficult. Um, you know, so for instance, like between uh, third and fourth grade, about 5,000 new kids are, are identified as learning disabled. Well, that's about a 10% increase in the special ed population just in that one year. So th that's going to affect, if you look at test scores from third grade to fourth grade, can you compare those two groups? You can't. Uh, what you need to do is to be able to look at each individual student and say, uh, oh, I see on average students, individual students are making these gains. Uh, and that's a pretty complicated thing. You have to have the right kind of data systems, you have to have the right kind of people. Uh, yet another thing about the that, that's different about the special ed population is that district practices really affect the percent of kids who are identified. In our first report, we have a map of county, the incidence of special ed by county. And the highest county was about 17% of kids were special ed. And the lowest county was 7%. So that's a huge gulf, right? And I talked to both of those <coughs> educators in those counties, and I said, what's going on? And up in one county, they're really into multi-tiered system of support. They're getting kids' services way before they're identified for special ed. And they're trying to make, see if they can design services and address those kids' needs so they don't have to be identified. And special ed is at the end of this series of different kinds of interventions. In the other county, with a high level of kids, that system just doesn't exist. And uh, you know, there's lots of reasons for that. I don't want to. Um, make this a, a negative, but, you know, basically special ed is the gateway for services uh, in those places. So how do you compare the performance of a, a, a districts and county where they have 7% unspecialized versus 17%? Well, I mean, it's, it's not like one county really has a lot more disabled kids. It's how they're treated and, and so the more severe kids are going to be in special ed in one county compared to the other kid, the other county will have a much broader range of, um, of disabilities uh, in their, their population. So, so accountability has to accommodate this kind of complexity. And I think what that means to me is that growth is really more important than levels. Okay, we want to see kids are making progress and um, and really, we need to even get further down into the data and say, uh, you know, can, can we gauge performance on a more of a similar student basis where we say, you're performing at this level, well, kids who look like you performing at this level make these average gains. How did you do compared to kids that were in your situation? And that's a very different system than what we have currently. Um, so I'll leave it there.